Coming up on DTNS, Owen J.J. Stone is here to help us understand when we can start paying attention to 8K. Is it soon? Plus, NVIDIA may lay down ARM. And Google has an even nicer way of tracking you for ads. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, January 25th, 2022. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Joining us, Owen J.J. Stone, a.k.a. O Doctor. You can text him right now, 844-986-4563. That's a real giving, number. You can actually text me. You're giving out that me. number to everybody. That's so cool. I, I, I like when people say hi to me. Say hi to me and join my revolution against Tom Merritt, where I come on his own show <laughs> to start a revolution. This is the problem with now. Owen. I've been doing a newsletter. I'm like, email me and I'll email you. Owen has to big time me and be like, well, you can text me. It's even easier. You, you, get, you get right to the captain of the ship over here, baby. I mean, I, Tom <laughs> Harris too big time. I'm still a small fry <laughs> in the bottom of the bag. You know what I mean? I'm the extra fry in the bottom of the bag. I'm here for you. We did to have everything else. You reach back in there and I'm still waiting on you, brother. Text I, 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 I upset <laughs> Owen <clears throat> before the show. With a uh, heartbreaking pun. Uh, you can find out more about that in the long version of the show, Good Day Internet, available at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's Big start thanks, with a few sir. tech things you should know. I, I was supposed to say. Sorry, Sarah, go. That's fine. I just wanted to thank a couple of our top patrons first. High Tech Oki, Martin James, and David Mosher. Uh, why am I so messed up? It's because Owen's here. He got me off my game. See, <laughs> I'm, I'm, Owen? I'm I'm so happy about it's this. It's working. When, when Tom messes up, Watch it brings Tom joy to my heart. Down oh, it's great. On it's this so, episode of DTNS. It's already a perfect show. Let's go. All right, let's start with a few tech things. You actually should know the cryptocurrency exchange Coinbase is adding a new tax center to help U.S. customers figure out how much they may owe the IRS. Oh, what fun. The new section gathers every taxable transaction, showing a personalized summary of a customer's taxable activity on Coinbase, broken out over time by realized gains or losses and miscellaneous income with the information able to be used with tax software. Microsoft issued a warning that hundreds of Office 365 customers are getting phishing emails trying to trick them into granting OAuth permission. Uh, that would let attackers read and write email, post to their calendar, read and write their contacts. The app that requests the permission is just called Upgrade and appears to come from a verified publisher. So it's kind of hard to detect if you're not paying close attention. Microsoft has deactivated the malicious app in Azure AD. This is a type of attack called consent phishing, which tricks the user just into granting access by clicking OK without having to actually hand over a password. Signify announced three new Philips Hue outdoor smart lights with HomeKit support coming March 1st. HomeKit, among others. The Inara features an Edison-style bulb for outdoor use. $100 for that. The Philips Hue Luca will offer white and color-changing lights, also $100. And then the Resonate wall light will go for $160. All three lights require the Hue Bridge and do work with the Hue app HomeKit, as I mentioned, Google Home, Amazon Service, and Samsung SmartThings. The Hue app will soon offer new candle and fireplace effects for all bulbs as well. Oh, nice. YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki's quarterly update revealed the platform was going to test new ways for YouTube Shorts, which is kind of their TikTok, Instagram Reels type thing, uh, to make money for creators through Brand Connect and is in the early phases of testing how shopping can be integrated with shorts. The platform is also looking at ways to support NFTs. Wojcicki continues to defend YouTube's hiding of public dislike accounts, saying the feature was harming parts of the ecosystem through dislike attacks, though she did not specify whether the ecosystem refers to creators or corporations. The Ethereum Foundation has decided to change the name of Ethereum 2.0 to the consensus layer. That part of the network handles smart contracts and network rules, aka the Ethereum 1.0, and will now be called the will be will be called the execution layer. The point of the exercise is to make the transition from proof of work, which uses a lot more power, to proof of stake. Once the new system is ready to replace the old mining system, the two layers will merge and go back to being just plain old Ethereum. <laughs> Hope you were taking notes. The name change will help repent scams that try to imply that there are two Ethereum networks being created, which isn't the case. Yeah, calling it Ethereum 2.0 when it was just going to get merged back uh, was was probably confusing. So that makes sense to me. All right, let's talk a little more about NVIDIA. Bloomberg sources saying they might just abandon 
their attempt to acquire chip designer Arm from SoftBank. That deal uh, was agreed upon in September 2020 and has been awaiting regulatory approval, which may now never come. NVIDIA reportedly told partners it does not expect the transaction to close. SoftBank is reportedly prepping an IPO for ARM, just in case that doesn't happen. So I guess SoftBank's move, if NVIDIA decides to abandon the deal, is to just spin out <laughs> ARM as a public company. Companies including Qualcomm, Intel, and Google claimed ARM could not maintain independence under NVIDIA and would therefore harm competition. So they were pushing regulatory agencies to prevent the merger. NVIDIA promised to sell ARM licenses to all, but apparently that didn't convince anybody. In October, the EU began an investigation of the deal over competition concerns. The UK began its own investigation in November on antitrust and national security grounds. And in December, the U.S. sued to prevent the merger over concerns it would stifle innovation. So a tall order for NVIDIA to try to surmount. Uh, China hadn't even got into it yet. Uh, China had expressed concerns and probably would have opposed the merger, but it doesn't even like look like it'll get that far. Publicly, NVIDIA is not saying anything yet, still saying it believes the deal provides an opportunity to accelerate arm and boost competition and innovation. Uh, but Bloomberg says writing's on the wall. I wonder, um, I know that there is a, a breakup fee, uh, which is uh, really commonplace in these sorts of acquisitions that don't end up going through. And if this doesn't end up going through, who suffers more here? You know, is it ARM? Is it NVIDIA? Uh, and I mean, I suppose it's, you know, p people who care about products from both companies, but uh, it seems like ARM may suffer from this uh, unless there's a really great IPO to be seen in the future. Yeah. So according to this uh, real quick, it's, it's uh, NVIDIA paid a fee that SoftBank gets to keep if the, the, the deal doesn't go through. Yeah. Which I think is $2 billion, which is yeah, yeah. not uncommon, you know, cause yeah. it, it's sort of like, okay, we all have good faith that we really want this to happen. And if we spend a lot of time and resources and legal fees and it doesn't happen, then somebody walks away with some money. But yeah, I just, I, I wonder how, how this might be bad news that going forward, because clearly, yeah, you know, a lot of folks didn't think it was a great idea. In the simplest terms, why didn't the argument just have their hands up like this and say, but Apple, could you help us out? Like we're trying to, we, we have to make some things happen where they're trying to merge and get together. Like there's a reason we're going to sell to everybody. Cause trust me, we need more money. So I, I don't know the, the IPO in this market and this climate, uh, good luck. Yeah. I feel like I, I, my instinct is that SoftBank gets hurt the most by this because SoftBank was the one trying to cash out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, the, and, yeah. and yes, ARM would have benefited from increased resources from NVIDIA uh, there, but I don't think it hurts ARM as much. And in, in some ways it may be better because uh, as the US FTC phrased it, uh, ARM is the Switzerland of, of the chip world. And this mm -hmm. keeps them in that position. Now, if doing an IPO doesn't bring in enough money for them to fuel further innovation and ARM starts to go into a long, slow Intel-like decline, I guess that would be the worst case scenario that I could think of. But I don't think suddenly ARM just collapses overnight. I don't, I don't get the sense that they're, they're in that bad of a situation. So it's bad from NVIDIA because they're out a couple billion dollars and they don't get ARM. Uh, it's probably good for the chip sector in general because even if NVIDIA was the best behaving uh, possible, it was still consolidation no matter how you looked at it. Uh, and it's bad for SoftBank because they wanted the money. And and if ARM's IPO, or if ARM does fall off for some odd reason, then they could go back later on and be like, hey, well, we're here again if you want to. Who wants us? Yeah, yeah like right? we're, we're trying to buy you now. Like somebody's going to, either way, it'll be fine. There, there'll be innovation. There'll be creation. And if they falter, someone will be there to scoop them up, probably to discount. Get, yeah, recoup yeah. that $2 billion. But then it becomes who would be allowed? Who who would, not even who would be allowed, who would do it after seeing NVIDIA go through all this for more than a year? Oh, that's true, too. Yeah. Well, Google's been in the process of looking for products to replace what we all know as cookies, splitting the difference between privacy, which some people care about very much, and ad tracking, which other people care about very much. Google's first idea was called Federated Learning of Cohorts, or Flock, that would have added you based on data that Google knew about you into a group of people who had similar preferences. That way, an advertiser would only really know that they were showing an ad to a group of people 
Maybe Owen and I both like dogs and we both recently bought a car. We might be in the same group there. Tracking IDs would apply to that group, but not the individual themselves. However, there were concerns that Flock could be used to help form a browser fingerprint or otherwise deduce other information about any user. So Edge, Mozilla, Brave, and Vivaldi all declined to implement it in their browsers. Google just announced, okay, we've decided to stop development of Flock and replace it with a new attempt we're calling Topics. In this new system, your browser, let's say you're using Chrome, keeps track of what categories of websites that you're visiting fall into. Sensitive categories like gender or race aren't tracked, but something like team sports or rock fan might be. So might know your music habits, might know what kind of sports you're into. Google says there will be about 350 such categories to start, though that will expand over time to a few thousand. And your browser will keep this categorical data for three weeks, and then it'll delete it. It will never be stored on a server, but it will remain local to your device. Google categorized major websites and will also use some in-browser machine learning to determine the categories of other sites going forward. Still in its infancy here. The ad serving side of this works as follows. When you visit a site that supports the Topics API, the browser will look at your top five most visited categories from each of the past three weeks and choose one from each week at random to share with that site. Maybe I looked at a lot of sports and music things and linen sheets, you know, gets one. The site will then share ads on the page that targets people also interested in those topics. In Chrome, you'll be able to see what topics are in the list, so you're not in the dark about this, and then you can remove them if you want to. You can also turn off the Topics API altogether if you so desire. Google plans to trial the Topics API starting at the end of this quarter, so pretty soon, and if you're in for, if you're kind of like, nah, still don't like it. Do not track me. You're not happy with topics either. But it does seem like Google is trying to come to a place where privacy focused folks would feel a little bit more comfortable with this. Owen, what do you think? I live in a world where I don't care about the cookies anymore. I don't care. You're tracking me and the things are free. If if I if I'm that worried about you tracking my browser history, there's other ways that I can get around doing that. Um, at this point, I don't want to have to click off your topics. I don't have to say I don't want this topic in my group. I don't really want you serving my topics to people that are my friends. I, I just I just want cookies to stay cookies and just going about your day. I don't need flocks. I don't need topics. I don't like it. I don't like change. I am a 72-year-old man <laughs> and I am grumping on this whole idea. It's terrible. I don't like it. We're against But I it. mean, it's pro and and it definitely depends on how you use the internet, but there, there was, there was a day where we all complained about ads, just uh, ads, stupid ads everywhere. Most ads that I see now are targeted toward me, and sometimes I, it's pretty obvious why. Oh, I just looked at that website, and now it's, you know, in my Facebook feed. But sometimes it's a little bit more like, huh, how, what, why am I in this? You know, how, how they get me here? And so I feel like this is Google's way of kind of saying we're, we're not trying to target you that specifically. But if you're interested in how this is working, here's how it's working. Again, I rebuttal with the grumpy old man. I don't trust it. You know what bothers me most about tracking, right? I buy a watch. They know that I went online. They know that I bought this watch. For 92 days, I see the ad to say, buy this watch. And I'm like, I already bought this watch. So unless Topics allows me to click off of that one thing and say, stop showing me that, which I've already spent my money on, Okay, if it does that, I see. It actually see, would it, do that. If it, it actually that, would do that, Owen, I, because I have, it wouldn't have the cookie that tells them you bought the watch, and it would look at your recently visited sites and notice, like, oh, he hasn't been going to watch sites anymore. He must have bought the watch. Let's show him something else. As yeah. a seventy-two-year-old man, I have learned things on this planet, and I have revised <laughs> my position. I, I am not ignorant. I am all for topics. Give me topics today. Yeah, I I think what I like about it is that you can just turn it off if you're if you don't like it and the and and it knows less about you than cookies. However, if you're coming at it from the other side of I don't want it to know anything about me, will this prevent that? No. No. Uh, there's certainly ways people could use it, but they they do make it very difficult to build a profile of you because this isn't even identifying you as part of a group. It's just saying when the when the when you go to the website. Oh, if you want to show an ad, here are three topics you could show ads for. And it won't be the three same three topics every time you visit that site, right? It'll change uh, because it's random every time. So it, that makes it harder to build a profile around people. But of course, you know what's more secure? 
uh, just first party ad that says, oh, I'm at a site that sells watches. Maybe advertise the watch to this person and don't advertise the watch if I'm not at a site that sells watches. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I, can, I complain myself back into it, so I'm fine now. And I'll give it a try. I just didn't want to have to do anything else. It's I'm already I'm already mad when I gotta accept cookies. Like that's you're making me do work. I came yeah. here to do well, well, get rid of that too. You wouldn't yeah. have the cookie stuff anymore because they wouldn't be setting cookies anymore. I mean exactly. that that alone is yes. worth yeah. worth the price I'm, of admission. I, I am back on board. We are flocking and grouping and tagging and all the things. Top all topics. Right. Topics. So yes. As, topics. As <laughs> as Google ends their flock, Twitter begins one. Input Ooh. Magazine reports that engineer Alessandro Paluzzi found code in the Twitter app describing a close friends feature. If, you, if you've if you noticed, Instagram has a close friends feature that lets you share stories with a list of people that you create instead of just to anybody who follows you. Uh, Twitter shared design concepts for a similar thing they were calling trusted friends last July, but Paluzzi just found a description in the code that calls it Twitter flock although this one's spelled F-L-O-C-K. It says you can add up to 150 people to a flock. You can keep it just two if you want, but you can have up to 150. When you post to your flock, only those people in your flock will be able to see you and reply to your post. People will not be notified if they're removed from your flock, so they'll just stop seeing those and they'll never notice otherwise. Paluzzi also found a label on posts that says, you can see this tweet because the author has added you to their flock. So they will know if they're seeing a post because they're in your flock, but they won't know if you remove them. Twitter told The Verge that flock is a placeholder name, but it didn't share any more news about the feature. It would seem like a pretty obvious one uh, if that was the 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 name at the end of all of this, but okay, whatever flock ends up being in concept. I like this. This is not how I use Twitter. I figure anything that I say on Twitter, it's like, you're either going to get it or you're going to like it or you don't, or you see it later and it doesn't apply to you. And that's fine. It's the wild west, but Twitter is trying as, and with a rollout of lots of different products has been trying to be much more of a focused way to use a social network as, uh, you know, a place for news, a place to talk to friends, you know, the DTNS, uh, we could have our own flock, uh, you know, or, or that sort of thing. Stuff that a lot of other companies have already offered services for. A lot of the stuff that Twitter talks about, I, I still I still want to know, you know what, what team out there is like, yep, Twitter's suite of services are the way that we go. Uh, and because it seems a little bit too too little too late as far as Twitter goes, but I don't know. It, it's it's always good to give people options where, for example, you know, I, I, I have a group of friends who have um, their Twitter accounts locked. I mean, they can say that it's okay that I follow them and then I can see their tweets, but um, it kind of breaks the service overall. So this seems like some sort of a bridge between the two. Uh, show, show title, Grumpier or Old Men. I mean, I, I tweet the way that I tweet and it, at some point, I got to click through 92 levels of things. I've got to select now who can reply, don't reply. I've got to put in a poll. My location's off. My location's on. Draft, not draft. Like, I, I go there to be grammatically incorrect, say the dumbest thing possible, and hope that it catches fire and a million people retweet it, okay? Yeah. That's what Twitter is for. And again, like you said, too little, too late. You're trying to throw all this garbage into the kitchen sink at me now when I'm here... Because guess what? I could cultivate my own group. I'm only following like 600 people. You know what I mean? Those are the people that I, I, I need to hear and listen to. If you want to be willy-nilly and follow 150,000 celebrities, that's on you. If you want to, again, the only thing I heard that was great about that is if you have a, a group of you know, people that listen to your podcast or your show or, your, or their, their influencers maybe, and you want to say, hey, we got this new product. You guys get to see it first or something like that. Cool. I guess throw it in there because Twitter's going to do what they want to do. But at the end of the day, it's just too much stuff in my Twitter. Now I, I got to be in Twitter blue. I got to but the premium. You should have been half premium. You don't have to do any of that stuff, I, uh, right? Tom, but I have to do it all because once they put it in there, it's like drugs. I got to try it. It's free. So, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's a gateway drug. I'm a, I got to try it, baby. You know, that's how they get you. Uh, the, the thing I'll say say in, de drug in defense of Flock would be like... Uh, the old Twitter, people talk about, man, it used to be you could just talk to your friends on Twitter and you didn't have all these random people coming in because it didn't have that big of a user base. Flock would let you simulate that. 
where you yeah. could just be like, here are the people I want to talk to. Sometimes I want to talk to the entire world, but sometimes I want to say something and I don't need everybody jumping in because they're not going to get it. Uh, I message. Yeah. I message. Sorry. I mean, honestly, that's well, the so, problem, right? That's where that, I that's where I, I end up back where you where you are, Rowan. It's like, but people don't use Twitter for that. So yeah, and that, they use and, group chats, they use Telegram, they use but Signal. Uh, but also yeah, there WeChat. are people that I'm friends with on Twitter, not as the only social network, but Twitter as an example, where I'm like, I don't really even know their number or like putting us the five people that I think would like my tweet on a group chat would seem a little strange because we're already on Twitter. That's where this kind of thing comes into play. How much this would replace group texts, I don't know. Yeah. The last question. Uh, will others be able to see that you created a, a flock? Like, will they say, oh, Sarah's created two flocks. And I'll tell you what, if I'm not in those flocks, I will be offended. This is a verbal contract that I will be included in right. your flock, Sarah. I, I will be I included in your I get the sense that you only flock. create one flock, though. So... If oh. you want want bigger stuff, you get communities and that, you do that, a community. That's, that's when you go to Twitter Blue and you get an extra flock. You got to pay yeah. four ninety nine. You get a bonus flock. You get two flocks. <laughs> uh, so many flocks. <laughs> uh, well, hey, folks, uh, if you would like more DTNS, you're like, I don't need more flocks, but I want more DTNS. Nikki Ackerman's Dr. Nikki uh, has the latest installment of her Scientist in Tech miniseries out. She interviewed a researcher who uses drones to help map out ancient Pueblo archaeological sites. Uh, and if you're like, where do I find that? Right here in the DTNS feed. Uh, check out this past weekend and listen in. It's really good. Enjoy. All right. 4K is the current standard for high def video, whether you're talking about displays, you're talking about content that's going on to an eventual display. But 8K offers a pretty big jump in resolution. In fact, it's like going from 1080p to 4K, 4K to 8K. Now, everybody who listens to DTNS has certainly heard of 8K, but for many of us, still too pricey, kind of hard to find, the good stuff. So when will 8K be necessary, and will it be necessary? Owen, you're here with us, so you know we're going to put you in the hot seat to tell us all about how you as a photographer feel about 8K and how it needs to be uh, uh, embraced by the, the greater human race. So as you heard earlier, I'm a, I'm a man of strong convictions until I get uh, instant feedback that turns my mind. But <laughs> previously, I just bought a camera to do uh, work, and I was like, I only need 4K. I don't need 8K. Nobody displays 8K. Nobody really uses 8K. I don't need it. And I spent $5,000 on a camera. And then three weeks later, a new 8K camera came out, and I just was like, I think I need 8K. Now, displays are really expensive. No one's streaming 8k or anything yet but i'm like do i have fomo am i am i missing out like on the future should i future proof myself and that's what i told myself i need to future proof myself well and that i, I think a lot of people feel like well okay if we're going in this direction that's if you if you got the cash f future proofing is you know a great way to to upgrade some of the things that you really care about but as far as the person who is watching in 8k right now if you're shooting an 8K with your with your really nice camera and you'd like somebody to to uh, reap the rewards of that, I mean, how many people are really doing so? No one is reaping the rewards unless you're at the Comcast building and you've got 42 screens and there's a 3D lion coming out of, you, <laughs> out of the wall. No one is actually really reaping the benefits of it. Uh, and that's sad. Also, you could barely get true 4K streaming. I, I tried to upgrade YouTube to 4K. I didn't see any difference. I downgraded. It doesn't matter. This show right now, people watch you and love you, and we're probably in 720p or 1080, and people have no problem with it on their phone. So it's not even that you can even use it in most uh, circumstances, but I do have a situation where 8K is super viable and could work really well for a lot of people. Anonymous. All right, I'm intrigued. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I, so it's not good enough for my TV. It's not good enough for my YouTube. What is it good for then? So I had to shoot an interview of a uh, cast for a play, and there were ten people. And I was like, all right, I'm going to set up three cameras and run all this stuff. And I, I realized that one of my cameras is 8K, though I never use it. I shot an 8K, and I turned out each person's frame would be 1080. So I could I could punch in mm. to 1080 from the 4K resolution. This gives you more options later. Yes, and that's where 
it works out because you can up uh, you can up res 1080 to 2k which is basically fake 4k and it looks really good and i'm like ah that is a good reason to use 8k just for the zoom and crop factor you know when people like to punch it on the youtube videos you'd actually mm -hmm. zoom right into an eye and it'll still be crispy so that's the only value and reason i found to use 8k because also the media that it eats up is tremendous and you've got to be a rich person to shoot more than 10 minutes right now it's just insane but yeah, that's yeah. a good reason. That's a really but, good reason. But I, I, I think that's that's a really good point. A reminder that when we talk about these new technologies, uh, sometimes we just focus on one use. Like, oh, 4K. It's just a marketing term to get me to buy a new TV. Uh, maybe, maybe, and probably it will be used <laughs> for that. But that doesn't mean that it's the only use for 8K. Because what you're describing is not an end user benefit, but a creator benefit for for somebody creating content. 8K might be really important because. While when costs get uh, a little cheaper, it simplifies things. Yep, and you can always scale down and punch in and, and do mm -hmm. things like that. Like uh, when you watch the movies, and always like enhance. Enhance really isn't a real thing, but now there's enhance. Like if I just yeah, need you to really get can. down to 720, I could put 16 of them on the screen. You know what I mean? So that that's the the best benefit. That's what I talked myself into spending more money, and I justified it to myself. I said, what if I needed to talk to 10 people all the time? and they need their own screen. That's how I convince myself. I mean, yeah. that's, that's a really, really good point that as a creator, you have so much more leeway because you just have these huge files that sure, I mean, maybe my eyes can't even see 8K, but yeah. the the fact that there there's, there's going to be no discernible artifacts that I will also see with my naked eye, <laughs> you know, being able to, uh, to, to take advantage of this. But is there is there a situation where I, as the you know, I'm tired. It's the end of the night. I'd like to watch an 8K movie. Uh, you know, is, is it is it at all worth it at this point? No, it is not. Because all you're going to get is buffering errors if you did have an 8K TV and you tried well, to stream there's it that. to look at it. Like, and there's it, no content. Uh, there, there, yeah. Yeah. And again, the 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 difference to what you're saying, even still, like that's why the phone, the screen, the the Resolution doesn't even matter. The screen's so small, you're happy with what you're seeing at 1080 or anything like that. People, 90 hertz, like you can't really tell the difference. I can give you 10 phones. It's hard for you to pick it out unless you're playing a game. So your eyes can't tell the difference. And your screen at home isn't big enough that 4K to 8K, you're going to be like, oh, that's definitely 8K. 4K looks pretty dang gum good when you got true 4K coming through and you're watching like the Animal Planet on Blu-ray or something. Like it, I don't, I don't, in my mind, I don't know how it could get any better. So right now yeah. we're, at, we're at a standstill of the value of what your brain can consume mm -hmm. and realize, I believe. I mean, uh, if you want 8K, look look with your own eyes. Don't look at the screen. Just 4K open the front enabled door. <laughs> HDR to work really well. So 4K was handy for a reason that didn't have anything to do with resolution. Maybe something comes along like that with 8K, but we don't know. It. We don't see it yet. Yeah, 4K is pretty perfect right now. Well, uh, John Lennon, you may have heard of him. Uh, he has a couple of sons, and his older son, Julian, is selling memorabilia from his father's personal collection as NFTs. Examples include a black cape from the film Help, handwritten notes by Paul McCartney for the Beatles song Hey Jude, things that, you know, if you were a collector, you might be pretty interested in. But the physical items themselves not being auctioned off. These are NFTs that are audiovisual collectibles of each item with Julian Lennon himself narrating the story behind each piece. Uh, okay. All right. I was like, if you're into NFTs, obviously, you know, maybe you're into this. If you're not into NFTs, you're going to scoff at this just like you would anything else. But adding in the, the narrated story uh, behind the piece, kind of a nice touch. I like that. A little added and value. And the physical item, you know, not being sold off somewhere. Like if it ended up like in a museum one day. Yeah, I, right. I, I wouldn't mind being like, what, the biggest thing about NFTs when you say, oh, it's just art. I wouldn't mind being one of the 10 people that have a digital ownership of the Mona Lisa and is sitting in the Louvre for the next billion mm -hmm. years. At yeah. least I got my little piece of the Louvre, you know? So yeah, it, that's, yeah. that's neat. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes in from Jeff, who wrote in based on our discussion yesterday about waste heat and the idea of trying to more efficiently use heat and not waste it. Jeff says, I saw an article over the weekend about using waste heat for additional power generation via the thermal electric devices. I'd be excited to see when these types of developments are able to make it down to the consumer level of products. For instance, having thermal electric devices on solar panels could increase panel output by transferring heat buildup on the face of the panels into liquid coolant or disperse it via radiators under the panels. 
Another potential location in homes could be flue gases from water heaters or furnaces. Those with cooling loads could possibly have these on their AC compressors or even on the outside of the house. Power plants could efficiently utilize this technology, but also things like data centers. (laughs) Jeff finishes off with, as the joke from James S.A. Corey made when asked... When do the spaceships in the Expanse universe, what what do the ex, uh, spaceships in the Expanse universe run on? They replied, efficiency. Yeah. No, these are good. These are good examples. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks to also to our brand new bosses, Thomas Taylor and Wayne Dernancourt. Both just started backing us on Patreon. Yay, you're our new bosses of the week. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Wayne. Man, we make a big deal when we get a new boss. Thank you, Wayne. Thank yeah. you, Thomas. Standing no. Also, standing no to Owen J.J. Stone. Oh, Doctor, always good to have you on the show. Let folks know where they can keep up with everything you feel about AK, 8K and otherwise. Uh, I'm at IQMZ.com. Oh, Doctor on everything. I'm, I'm currently building my flock, so the first 150 people, <laughs> you, you automatically get put in a flock. That's what, that's, what it is. that's what it is. I'm out here in these streets. <laughs> well, we're so happy to have you on the show today. Please come back soon and early and often. Uh, any, reminder any to... Time? Yeah, Heart Hearts. We're live on this show Monday through Friday. Uh, we hope you heart our show every day. Uh, that's 4.30 uh, p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back doing it tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you soon. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>